Any questions or anything, or just want me to start in talking? Just talk. <laughs> I'll tell you what I like so much now, guiding. When I first started guiding here, back in the 70s, there was a thing like a playpen, for want of a better terminal, but it was rails pitched to the door frame. So only a few people could go into the room. Oh, oh, the question yeah. was, if you had five or six people, did you stand in the hall and holler over their heads? Because most of the time what would happen, they turn around to look at you instead of looking at the room. Mm -hmm. And this used to come up a lot because we got bus trips you wouldn't believe. Really? There used to be buses that would come to Marblehead from Boston where people would be on a holiday or a seminar or a convention. And then one of the things was a bus trip to Marblehead. And they would come by the bus load. And this was something to do in that house, mm -hmm. let me tell you. It was very difficult. Wow. So um, the fellow who preceded me as executive secretary had a very weird way of doing it. And the minute <laughs> I got the job, that was the end of that. <laughs> and, um, it was, we got a lot of people, a lot of people. Now we don't. How did you handle that? Now we don't. Well, there have been a number of articles in very good magazines and publications about the problem with house museums. They're not attracting people. Mm -hmm. First of all, you watch now uh, Antiques Roadshow, and they will have an appraisal from 1999 mm -hmm. for a beautiful piece of furniture. Not museum quality, but very nice. And they give you the estimate, and then they show it currently. Yeah, mm -hmm. always goes down. It's almost, you could buy something now that's, and it bothers me. Um, I go into the Lee Mansion and do the tours and I look at these desks. Nobody wants a desk anymore. <laughs> Everything is on the computer. So they don't want a desk except to put the computer on. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Um, so that was like, also there was a dress code. <laughs> You may not wear pants. Oof, wow. Even in the coldest days of the winter. Well, we never win the winter, but you know, the fall right. could be cold, and the spring, no pants. Hmm. Skirts below the knee. I got a fun one. <laughs> there was a girl who lived two doors down, the brick house on Washington mm -hmm. Street, around the corner. Mm -hmm. She was a knockout. I mean, she was very, very attractive, and she knew it. But she also had presence. In other words, don't mess with me. That kind of thing. But she wore, she loved antique jewelry and she had some beautiful pieces. But her stuff was not quite sprayed on, but it was. And one of the ladies committee came one day and she said, Who is that? And I said, Her name is Karen McLaughlin and she lives around the corner. She's one of our guys. Well, it was obvious that she was not one of our guides, as the woman would want it. But you know what that girl did for a living? She, she was an engineer on the B and M railroad. She ran the, the bike cars from Boston to Gloucester and back. You didn't mess with her. And she was wonderful because she had a sister who was an alcoholic, and she lived with her sister and took care of her. She's a wonderful girl. Yeah. So how did you start at the Historical Society, at the mansion? How did it all begin? Good question. Yeah. Um, I had house guests one time, and my husband was working in Boston, so he wasn't available. And I thought, what am I going to do with these people? And I said, let's go to the Lee Mansion. So we went through with a guy who was dynamite. Her name was Edith Backer. And she had one compliment for somebody that was really good. Oh, she's so smart. She's smart. <laughs> Edith was a teacher. And I went through with these people, and we had the best time. And Edith said to me, have you ever thought of guiding here? And I said, no, I never has. I don't know anything about furniture. I know it's a chair, and this is a table, <laughs> and this is a rug. But beyond that, you know, I didn't know anything. So I thought, that might be kind of fun. So I started that way. And the fellow who was the executive secretary at the time, his fort was America Decorative Arts. I don't, he wasn't trained in it, but he trained himself. 
and we all, the guys would all sit on the staircase in the Lee Mansion, and he'd have several chairs at the bottom of the staircase, and he would point out the differences between Apple White and Sheraton and Chippendale and the legs and the stretchers and the backs and the Prince of Wales plumes and all. So you learn all that stuff. Nowadays, when you go through, I never say that to anybody. They don't give a damn. <laughs> they really don't care. I point out certain things that are unusual. That French desk in the upper hallway. I hope our fearless leader doesn't cut me off at the knees with this one. The French roll top desk. Mm -hmm. If you look at the feet on that, they're little brass things. Mm -hmm. Funniest looking thing. My theory, unless I read it somewhere, is that that went on the deck of a vessel. Not on the top deck, obviously, the guy to watch <laughs> overboard, but down below. And it would fit into something on the deck. And then as the ship was moving, oh, he wouldn't have to chase the desk around. Makes sense. Sure. Yeah, that's yeah. good. And it comes in two pieces, if you notice. The top has handles on it, which gives you the idea that it's portable. Yeah. So I thought, I usually point that out to people. And I have another gimmick. The house is loaded with desks. <laughs> desks. Loaded yeah. with desks. So as we go through, I'll say to would you like a desk? <laughs> I'm going to go over the next, would you like a desk? <laughs> and it, but it also points it out to people mm -hmm. that we have them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of fun. One thing that some of the guides used to have a lot of trouble doing was children's tours. In other words, parents yeah. come in with two little darlings. Mm -hmm. That is not a house for small children. Mm -hmm. The gables, in a way, yes, for instance. You could get away with that, the secret staircase up to Clifford's room and all that sort of thing. I guided there 100 years ago. I knew Nathaniel well. <laughs> anyway, um, one of the things, if you ever have this, and it's a problem, would you do me a favor? You look at the look. Would you count the desks, the desks, I'm all right. <laughs> count the bathrooms and the fireplaces. Mm. Oh, okay. Mm. Well, you can keep track of the fireplaces yourself. But when you get down partway through the tour, how many fireplaces have you counted? And they tell you, mm. usually it's pretty accurate. And as you go a little further, how many bathrooms have you counted? <laughs> and there's this. <laughs> Look, they were people, even adults going through, don't think of it. Right. Um, the cold, that was their winter home. 12 foot ceilings? It's like watching HGTV and then people will come into a house with a two story front hall. Uh -huh. And I look at them and I think, are you crazy? <laughs> you gotta eat that thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. How are you gonna eat it? Right. Yeah. Um, I can remember funny things that happened. Um, one guy had a couple of men that she was showing through, and she came into the office and she said, Betty, I'm having a kind of a funny feeling about these two guys. Could you, you know, visit sometime during the tour? I said, sure. So at some point, I grabbed a handful of papers and I walked purposely through, mm -hmm. and I looked at it and she went, in other words, I don't need you. Uh -huh. Turns out that they were furniture dealers. And what they were doing was getting down on the floor and looking under the furniture. And she was like, uh -huh. what the heck is going on? <laughs> <laughs> under the furniture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, thanks to my guiding years, I did learn a lot about nowhere near, but I did learn quite a bit about furniture and the way the furniture was made and the different things that you look for and is characteristics of a piece of furniture. That's kind of interesting. I, there's a fellow who, fellow who guides on Saturday mornings and he loves furniture and he collects books. Chuck, Chuck, Chuck. And yeah. Went, yeah. Chuck he's Mann. good. Yeah. Yeah. He's very good. He's a great guy. But the furniture books weigh 400 pounds a piece, and he brings them in for me to take home. <laughs> um, so he's kind of got stopped doing that. But um, we got into a discussion one day about sandpaper. I said, "What? Did, you look at the furniture, you think, how did it get so smooth? Did they have sandpaper? Yes, they had sandpaper. 
and it was actually lots of little pieces of glass stuck to paper was one way. They also used shark skin. Huh. Well, shark skin is rough, and they would use that too. So my friend Chuck took, looked up two articles on sandpaper. Would you like to see copies of them? Yeah. Um, <laughs> on what, how far back that goes, quite a distance. Cool. Middle Ages. Oh, wow. Really? And, you know, 10th, 10th, 11th, I think, 12th century, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I was interested in seeing that because the orders for it put through and how many pieces were used. But I thought that's how they did it. But can you imagine sanding the yards and yards and yards of mahogany? In the good. front, at floor, mm -hmm. at second floor, yeah. hallway yeah. of the Lee Mansion. <laughs> yeah. oh. When you look at the work that went into those things, all those little moldings and things in the great room yeah. going up in the acanthus leaves, and some little guys with a chisel, you know, <laughs> hour after hour. And even that newel post, you know, that oh, card. Oh, yeah. Newel newel post. Post. yeah. Some of the stuff they could use lathes on. That's true. That's true. I true. mean, the balusters, for right. instance. Right. And it was like a sewing machine on my uh, mother's day. You did it with your foot. But fun things, don't do this unless you're sure that the person who is talking to you knows what the heck they're talking about. But I had a guy from Harvard Graduate School of Design, one of the professors. <laughs> I used to remember his name, but I don't know. And we went into the family parlor. And I point this out to people because it's very interesting. He said, oh, those eyelashes <coughs> have antithesis. The what? I said, they look all right to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, what it is is a bulge. As the thing comes down, it eventually goes out, and then it comes back in again. Oh. And the eyelashes in that room and in the room over it while they're stop fluted. Mm -hmm. Did you get that? <laughs> God, this woman is marvelous. Yes, you're the best. <laughs> you are the best. <laughs> so, they're stop fluted. They, they do have that bulge. And if you, now that we can go into the rooms, and some people, somebody's, oh my gosh, look at that. And you think, what a subtle thing to do. Where, I'm not exactly sure. Where's the pilaster? Okay. Where am I looking? It's, well, the pilasters are those carved things flanking the fireplace that go oh. from floor to ceiling. Okay. You have them in the two rooms on the right hand side of the house, mm -hmm. the family parlor and the room above. Um, it's all the typical over mantle of that period with the election mold and the two raised panels and flanking okay. pilasters. Okay. And if you look carefully, I think the outside pillars also on the porch. Go out. So that was purposeful. Yeah, they purposeful. wanted yeah, them to yeah, do that. Yeah. So is that strictly a design thing, or did they it designed it that way? Okay, yeah. it's not to hold any weight or. No, no. This, no they were done purposefully that way. Purposely, purposefully, 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 that way. Apparently, again, this guy from Harvard was saying something about the Greek temples that had mm -hmm. um, pillars mm -hmm. going for miles. Mm -hmm that they did it then because it gave a sort of symmetry that wasn't quite right if you didn't do it. That's a bad explanation, but it, it's an ancient treatment of pillars and pilasters. So I thought that was kind of fun to learn. But my point being, don't repeat anything as the gospel unless the person who's telling you is an expert because you can come up with some really weird things. <laughs> you think, oh, sure. Uh, one of the things that was fun, the Prussian blue verdigris glaze room, Mrs. Lee's bedroom. I was working downstairs in the office, and the fellow who was doing the paint uh, analysis, analysis. Thank you, dear. I'm old. Um, <laughs> was going around and they say don't just go one place and go chip chip. They go everywhere and very carefully. And I heard this, wow and I thought, oh my gosh, he's cut his arm off. <laughs> and running upstairs, those shutter pockets in that room were never painted over. Mm -hmm. 
there's the original oh, paint wow. in there. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like much of anything. Right. Mm -hmm. um, fun story. There was a woman on the board, and she was also a member of the so-called House Committee. When I was working there initially, there was a House Committee, and it was their charge to the way the house looked. They would put the vase here or move the table there or, you know, that kind of thing. And Toddy Hammond was Mrs. Crown and Shield's niece. I don't know how, because they were someplace back in the family. And she's a tall lady, awful nice. She was a handy woman. She could run around and fix things. And she had a toolbox in the kitchen. She, matter of fact, she's the one who found those uh, linen bed coverings, bed furnishings. And in, Mrs. Lee's, in Mrs. Lee's uh -huh. suite, the cool yeah. work. Yeah. Uh, she was, I'll digress for a second. She was cleaning out Mrs. Crown and Shield's house when Mrs. Crown and Shield had died. The house was empty. And by the way, the house was torn down because nobody wanted it. Oh, this was on Peaches Point? Yeah, it? it was on Peaches yeah. Point. It's yeah. where the yellow Georgian revival is now. Mm -hmm. um, but nobody wanted the house, so it was torn down. And she was walking through and looked in, in a closet. And she, I thought I saw a box way down at the end. So she got it. I found a step ladder or something to stand on. And I got up and oh, there was a box. She pulled it out. And it was those linen mm -hmm. bed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's amazing that that yes. full set is intact and. Other fun yeah. story. There's were, a bed those, mm -hmm. Excuse me, were those, uh, the cool work, was that original to yeah. the. Uh, okay. The cool one. The, the bedroom. Yeah. Right. Not, to, not to the Lee's bedroom, but just it's original to the time period. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. The other fun thing is. One of the, executive, the executive secretaries ahead of me used to come in and visit from time to time, so I'd pick up little gems. And one of them was <laughs> the bed skirt in that room is some kind of polished cotton. I kind of forgotten what, what it is, but it's got a kind of a creamy color to it, or petite. So it's not white because it would look terrible with those the bed furniture. So the woman who was the executive secretary when Hardy Hammond brought these things in to be put up, what the heck am I going to use for a bed skirt? Her husband was a decorator and a upholsterer and stuff, so he had access to all kinds of fabric. So she got this white stuff, and she said, Betty, I bet I dyed 500 yards of stuff trying to get it to the right color. You know what that is? Tea. <laughs> she steamed it in tea and got the color she wanted. To get back to Toddy, <clears throat> she was at about the end of her career at the Historical Society. And she came into the room where there's hangings and everything. And she looked at the Prussian blue with the vertigree glaze. And she, I could see her just go. And I said, How do you, what do you think, Toddy? I don't like it. It had been a very pale green. Colonial Revival green, yeah. okay? And that's what Mrs. Crown and Shield had painted it, or had it painted. And I said, but remember, Mrs. Crown and Shield was at the forefront of historical preservation. Mm -hmm. There's an award given in her name by the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the Louise Crown and Shield Award. She was very big on it. She came thousands and thousands of dollars mm -hmm. and money I, and things. Okay. So I said, Toddy, she was in the forefront. Don't you think she would have enjoyed seeing something like this that is so honestly right? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that was all. <laughs> that was did, right. did you ever meet Louise Crown Shield? Oh, she had passed already. No. Oh. She, uh, no, because I, I didn't, ne I never met her, oh. but <clears throat> I remember her. When you do the October tour, mm -hmm. and we will stop down at, at looking across to where her house used to be, I do Louise Crown and Shield stuff there, which is kind of fun. First of all, she was one of my father's customers. That's kind of interesting. She had a pink and white awning, and she used to have a dress that matched the pink and the awning. <laughs> That's, That's a lot of entertaining. <laughs> a ton of it. 
with benefit of the historical society. She gave lectures at the, the Marblehead High School Auditorium. She did all kinds of stuff. She is terrific. But she was very large. Zoftic, I think is the <laughs> word. And I sat in the second pew from the back at St. Michael's Church when I was a little girl. And she would come to church in her woody. My f the chauffeur was Max Stern, nice guy. He'd drive her up in a wooden station wagon. <coughs> and the maid would get out with her, and she'd come in the house. And of course, I'm about, I'm under 10 years old, so this is fun. The pews in St. Michael's, the doors were about that wide. <laughs> now, to get a Zlostic female of advancing years up the step and into the <laughs> which, and I'll do my joke now. I remember reading a story about Madame Schumannheim, who was a Wagnerian soprano in the, I think, World War I period. And she also was rather large. And she would come through the orchestra to the apron on the stage to sing, and she'd be knocking music stands and <laughs> So one of the musicians, pardon me, Madame Schumannheim, but why don't you go through sideways? Young man, with me there is no sideways. <laughs> uh, one of the guys was a very good friend of Mrs. Crown and Shield, and she told me that Mrs. Crown and Shield could eat two lobsters at lunch. <laughs> the house was not much of anything. It was a great big Victorian pile. But the garden was gorgeous, and the fellow who bought the property and has it now he owns um, Kelly's Rose Beef. What the heck is his name? McCarthy. I can't McCarthy. think of his name. McCarthy. McCarthy. Yeah. He's restored the garden. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Nancy's in our garden club. Oh, Nancy, his yeah. wife? Is that his wife? Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. Still a connection. Yeah. Questions? I was, I was, okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. I was going to ask. <laughs> In the, all the years you've been guiding and, and there, have you ever met any um, descendants of the Trefries or the Reynolds or any of the bank families or anybody that remembered it when it was still a bank? Have you ever talked to anybody that... No, but I have a no. descendant of Lafayette. Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, he's a little guy. He came one year um, and he was fascinated with that Staffordshire platter that shows the Washing out of Lafayette's oh, home. Yes, in the closet, yeah, in the yeah, kitchen. In the closet, mm -hmm. in the kitchen. Okay. Yeah, he's very nice. He had a girlfriend with him. Was he French? Oh, merci beaucoup. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Very <laughs> French. But he, had, you know, like, doesn't it drive you crazy? You go on television, and here is some guy from Ghana. He's out of the jungle, and he's being interviewed, and he speaks English. It's accent. But he's speaking English. I don't speak Ghana. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the world speaks English, mm -hmm. but we don't speak whatever the heck they're speaking, including, unfortunately, our State Department. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a shame. If you go, when, boy, do I digress or do I know how to digress? <laughs> um, when Jacqueline Kennedy and her husband went to France, she could speak perfect French. Right. Right. And he said, I'm the, woman, I'm the fellow who came to France with her. She also spoke Spanish. So another interesting tidbit, Henry Cabot Lodge one time came to the house. And he had a family, a mother and father, and two teenagers from Paris with him. And do you know how he used to get voted in so quickly? In places like Lowell and Lawrence, you figure, a white Protestant, you know what? He spoke French fluently, and he would speak to the workers in the, fa in the factories in French. Mm -hmm. Well, you've got to have a rapport with that. Mm -hmm. So not a gun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, no, as far as people, descendants, I grew up in a house across the street from descendants of the lost cashier. Oh, Mr. Reynolds? Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh, Mr. Morrow, Mr. Reynolds. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I also um, have a, I think it's in that book that I wrote, though. I don't want to get into it. But 
one of the president of the society when I started working as executive secretary was Doris Smith. And they lived in the Azor Orn house on Orange Street. And his mother, Greg Smith's mother, was born in the Lee Mansion. She was the daughter of the last cashier. And she loved it. Lo this is Greg telling me. She loved living there. It was a great big house. She could have pretty much the run of it. And she used to love to go out in the necessary in the backyard because they had a they didn't tighten it all up. They had a place for ventilation, shall we say? <laughs> and she would get up and peek out and see who was coming, and she'd hear the scissor grinder coming down Summer Street. Ding, 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 ding. And so she said, ha, 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 you can't see me. <laughs> and when he'd stop to do work for somebody, she'd, oh, and she'd run into the house. That kind of thing. She loved it. When her father diddled the books, Greg never said it that way. They said they were forced <laughs> to leave the house. But when he did what he did, she was heartbroken and ashamed. She said, I'll never go back there as long as I live, no. ever. I, will, I can't do it. However, time does strange things to you. She married, got pregnant. She wanted her son born, or her child, she didn't know it was a son, it was her son, baby, born in the room where she was born. So they're, oh, okay, not exactly, you know, hospital ready, but <laughs> if you wanted. Which room was so, it? Hmm? Which room was it? As far as we, I know, it's what we, it's the second floor parlor the, chamber. Um, yeah, maybe, or the housekeeper's room, one of those, it could have been one of those second yeah. floor. We don't know for sure, yeah, we don't yeah. know for sure, but, but she, yeah. that ain't what she was born. Mm -hmm. So, again, years go by. Now we're at World War II time, and that son is ready to be sworn into the Navy. He's married very well in New York. His, his father-in-law is a judge. Could they, he be sworn in in the Lee Mansion mm -hmm. in the room where he was born? Mm -hmm. Sure enough, that they said, yep, yeah, the president of the society, his wife, Greg Smith and his wife, this is the younger brother of the fellow who was born there, Little boy from London. It was the time of the Blitz, mm -hmm. and the little boys, and they all lined up, and he was sworn into the service in the room where he was born. Mm -hmm. In the backyard, there is a humongous tulip tree, mm -hmm. and it was put there by the two boys in memory of their mother. Oh, nice. Oh, very nice. Mm -hmm. So that's a connection. Yes, that's huge. Yeah. That's the only one that I've ever mm -hmm. known. Was the, their name Smith all through that, or did, was there a well, name change no. because of marriage? Miss, Miss Reynolds married a Smith. Mm -hmm. Very common name. And so the Greg Smith and his brother, I don't know what his um, brother's first Theodore. name was, or Smith. Theodore. Right? That's right, Theodore, you got it. Mm -hmm. Hey, used to be young. <laughs> yeah, Theodore and Gregory. Those are the two children she had. Yeah. Betty, one of my favorite pieces in the house is the gold mirror above the pedro table in the great hallway. Um, as you go up the stairs. Yes. Um, uh, and I think it, I think I heard it was from Spain. Do you know any more of the history? What is it? The, the marble oh, table the, in the hallway. The Bilbao uh, mirror on the, the right Bilbao side. Mirrors. Above, it's above the one that's Above the table. That has the flowers on it or the other one? Or the, the carving. The, the carving. The carving. The carving, yeah. So the Bilbao, the marble, yes. red marble. Yeah. 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 That for some reason, I read someplace that Essex County mariners, the captains, masters, liked them. They were fairly inexpensive, probably. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of showy. Mm -hmm. okay. And so they used to bring them back. I don't know where we got those. A session book would tell us. But so it's from Spain? From Bilboa. Okay. Spain, yeah. And the other question I had was um, that table, we know there's a sister table in the State Department, the diplomatic yeah. reception room. Is there any information about um, the sisters, a sister table like spring and, and summer to go with, you know, autumn and, and winter? No information about that. What was her name? Haskell. 
can't think of her first name. She lived in Salem, she's a very nice woman. She had a lot of connections in Marblehead, worked on the garden club for years and years. And she told me this story. <laughs> she had a friend from, this is before she, this is before she gave the table to the State Department. She went through the mansion with a friend. And she, as they were leaving, she said, sotto voce, I have a table just like this one. And the guy took umbrage. There was, this is the only one that there is. <laughs> and so Mrs. Hatz, because she told me this with a big grin, and she, she I have one in my house. It's the same thing, except the figure is different in the center court. So when she so got rid of the house in Salem, she moved to the Adams House Apartments in Marblehead Condos. And she offered it to her children, and they said, no, we don't want it. Here we go again when people don't want these things. <laughs> so she told me she was disappointed, but she decided that she would give it to the State Department. I don't know if it was a sell sale operation or do you add, donate? I'm not so sure. <laughs> but um, she said, I went down on a tour some time later. And this is the kind of woman she was. She never would put herself in the forefront. And she said, I was in a group. And the man, what was his name? He was a curator down there. And he, Mrs. Haskell. He came running across the room and threw his arms around him. A simple hello would have just done it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, well, is it was interesting because on July 4th I was in the mansion and a Marblehead firefighter came in and he immediately walked over the t to the table, squared himself off, and he said, this is part of the action plan for the fire department. Uh, this table oh, is green <laughs> first at all costs. This is the most valuable piece in, in the in the mansion. And I got just such a, a kick, you know, out of listening to him. I would I would dispute that. I know. That's why you say the Bombay Oh, the Bombay <laughs> chest. Yeah. The Bombay. Oh yeah. So I had a question about that. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I don't, do you know how that's made? Someone told me, like, did they steam the wood to oh, get gosh, that no. shape? Oh, gosh, no. No, 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 steam. No. That's one single piece of mahogany that's carved. They didn't know. steam oh. when that was made. I didn't know. Okay. Yeah. Which, which one? The Bombay chest. The Bombay chest, the, the, the one that's got the, the kettle bottom. Right? Yeah. The, um, is that Nathaniel Gould? Is that what that's attributed yeah. to? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Nathaniel Gould, who provided the mahogany for the front hall. Right. He was a furniture maker in Salem, mm -hmm. cabinet maker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a beautiful thing. Again, beautiful. thank you, Louise Grantio. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, she had the capability of going. She finally didn't go to auctions anymore because everybody saw her coming. <laughs> <laughs> but she would, could go in and she would be someplace away from because she did it for the Peabody Essex. She did it for the all the big houses in Salem. She did it from and she see something. She, that would look good in the Moffat house. So she'd buy it and put it would in my, I swear to heaven, it was made for that spot. But that's the kind of person she was. Her brother, on the other hand, Alfred DuPont, he couldn't make up his mind about anything. And she'd call Scalamandre, as I've been told this by a number of people, she'd call, they'd set up, and she, also, I've got to do Man Boche, Man too, I've got to do that. Um, so they set up a table for her and with tea and whatever. And she would say, I'm here to look at fabric for such and such, such and such, such and such, and I want shades of, so they'd have no, an idea of what to bring out. And she, okay, I want 45 yards of that, 37 yards of that, and she'd have a book, and for which house? That was it. Her brother would come. <laughs> <laughs> He wouldn't know what he was, you know, he couldn't make up his mind, but she could. Mm -hmm. Remember I told you she was off the <laughs> These are some of the stories I do, hint, hint, on the October <laughs> tour, <laughs> hint, hint. Um, she used Mamboche for her bathing suits. Okay, and there would be 400 guys of black taffeta if we ever heard of it. You know, I mean, she was a big woman. So every time I am told, I think Mrs. is, yeah, I'm pretty sure, um, she would say, I'm going to be coming in from a bathing suit fitting. 
and they'd all go. <gasps> <laughs> um, she had a pool at the house on which, which is Emma McCarthy is restored, and she, I am told, I don't know, but she used to put a chemical in the water to see if which of the ladies was doing a no-no. <laughs> oh. I was there. Sorry. There's a little purple trail. <laughs> yeah, I love these stories. <laughs> Somebody who knew her well told me that. Now, whether they're lying, like, but it's such a fun thing to think of. <laughs> Are there any pictures, photographs of um, Mrs. Crownshoe? Yes. There are, I don't know what, where that one is in the book that I wrote, but... I don't know where that one came from either. There's oh. a, I'll get you guys copies of that book. There, and it's like an, her older, right? It's a side yeah. view of her older? Yeah. In one of the books that Amy Drinker did for here, there's a picture of her when she was young. And she was not exactly twiggy mm -hmm. then, but she was young. Mm -hmm. But this one, she's wearing probably sable and a formal outfit, and she's got her, it's like Queen Elizabeth, she's got a pocketbook. What is the queen having that damn thing? <laughs> um, but she, so she's in that, that yeah. book. I don't know where I found that photograph. What do you think the mansion was like before all of that furniture that she bought came in? Was it kind of empty? Awful. We only have a few pictures. Awful. It was awful. <laughs> because, <clears throat> bless marble headers, they were great like me, I'm trying to clean out my house. Who do you give this stuff to? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I call Vietnam vets and I come and I have life bridge in Salem and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to know who to give stuff to. Mm -hmm. But if you've got a marble head piece and marble head is like they keep things in marble head, mm -hmm. all of a sudden there's a place to give it. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? So the first thing I think in the accession book is is a Foot warmer, I believe. Yes, yeah, a foot, foot warmer. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, it's the number one gift. Thirty more. Yeah, <laughs> and things like that came. Some of the things you just assume not, but there you go. So, all of that stuff is marble head, and it's 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 terrific. What did I start to get on? Oh, what the mansion looked like before. Oh. Well, a lot of the stuff was stuff, foot stoves, bonnets, fans. Mm -hmm. um, fishing equipment, uh, all kinds of, what do you do? So there'd be glass cases in the hall and in the rooms with all this stuff in it. And <coughs> one or two pieces of furniture. If you look at some of the early photographs that you have very nicely put out, you'll see the things are very sparsely furnished, mm -hmm. very sparsely. In the nice rooms, there's no upholstered furniture. We didn't get any. You got old back Windsors that are in the kitchen, and you've got, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. The one thing about those Hancock chairs, does everybody know about those? Second floor landing, the leather Hancock chairs. Black mm -hmm. leather, yep. Um, the, the State House in Boston was going to expand, and unfortunately, there was a couple of houses in the bond plan. First of all, John, George, John Hancock's house was what would be now the part of the, his, the yeah, okay, state house. But in 1863, it was torn down, <coughs> which started the preservation movement, by the way. It's a bad thing to have happen because it was a beautiful building. <coughs> so that auction of the contents of this house was held, and there were posters around the city. And from what I heard about it, because I know where they came from, finally, to us. A man went in with a load of fish to the market, and he unloaded the fish, and while they were doing it, he said, let's go look and see what's at the auction. So he went up, and he saw the chairs, and he thought, oh, that's not bad. Price is good, so he bought six chairs. I can imagine the guys walking back to the fish pier with these things on their head, you know? But they came to Marblehead to a house on High Street, and the photographs of that building before it finally was torn down. The poor woman who lived in there didn't have a nickel to look at, and the house was in terrible condition. 
She hadn't paid taxes for centuries. There was nothing much in the house worth taking. <coughs> but the town of Marblehead said, we'll take those chairs in lieu of taxes. Ah. Mm -hmm. So they don't really belong to us. Right. They're technically their own. They belong to the, but, but they do now. But can you imagine if we hadn't had the, news, the historical society, they'd have wound up in Adam. Sat on by all and sundry, <coughs> stood on by all and sundry, probably <coughs> in pieces. Because we do have a number of things on technically on oh, loan yes, from yes. the town that go back to like 1898, 1900, yeah. 1909 when they had the mansion. Yeah. So these were things that were in Abbott Hall that came to us yeah. to hold them basically. But, but the people who knew, who did it knew that it was going to be preserved here. Mm -hmm. But if you put it out in the public. See you later. Mm -hmm. That's very important to keep things. Yeah, we've got a number of things. That portrait, I understand, of John Elbridge belongs to St. Michael's Church. Oh, the, the reverend that, in the front room? Is that right? I have to go back and look. I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't know. If it's to Elbridge Gary's grandfather. Mm -hmm. Over That's the piano forte yeah, yes. in, the, in the parlor. There's a portrait of a fellow who gave the chandelier to St. Michael's Church, that gorgeous oh, chandelier. Oh. And it was John Elbridge, Elbridge Gary's father. Interesting, too. Mm -hmm. The questions I get about things. Um, is the Taft White House still on Peaches Point? Mm -hmm. Well, right now, no. <laughs> but when I was working here as executive secretary, the kitchen wing was there. Taft spent the summers in Beverly. And the stuff, the house was floated across I can imagine him floating across, no. um, <laughs> floating, floated across, and there are photographs of it, and put in place in Peaches Point, which is interesting. Yeah. The kitchen wing was there when I was growing up, and when I was when I was working here, and one of the women who was very active in the historical society lived in it. That's one interesting thing. The other one was is this Gary Warehouse still standing on Front Street? Elbridge Gary's father had a, and a, a customs house was in this building for the while too. And the building is still there. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's still there. On Which Street? building is it? It's a pink, isn't it the pink house? It's a, a pink house on Front Street. No. No? Mm -hmm. I thought that no. was a weird the, uh, it, oh. If you go down Front Street, before you get to the slope that goes, it's on the right hand side. And it's a green, very large green building with a chimney at the end. It's been altered somewhat over the years. It's oh, the, I'm trying to think of it. Court. It's on the right hand side, obviously. Front Street's one way. So if you're going down, it's on the right hand side. Um, right after Yeah. And there's Samuel Gary's uh, warehouse. And then it is Elbridge Gary's father. And that was the custom house also? It was a customs house for a period of time. And then there's a brick building. You should come with me on the walks. Yeah. There's a brick building overlooking the parking lot at the Boston Yacht Club, which was yeah. a bay. That brick building was a custom house okay. at one time. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that is Nick's <coughs> Cove, mm -hmm. filled in land. One of the streets going down is Water Street, and there I have seen a photograph where there was water at the bottom. Of the <laughs> and Lee owned a lot of property on Nixco. Oh yes, he did. Oh yeah. yeah, he owned a lot of stuff down there. It's amazing how much real estate he did own, because he owned stuff on Washington as well, the main highway, whatever right. they used to be called. But a lot of buildings there too. He owned a lot of stuff. Yeah. What's your opinion as to how he ended up so? in debt, insolvent by the end of the war. Obviously he died, that's a part of it, but yeah. why did he have no money left? Well, he was doing a lot buying, of course, money. There wasn't a lot of coinage. Specie. It was a barter society. If you needed needles and thread, you'd bring a squash to the store and they, <laughs> you, then they'd give you that kind of thing. <clears throat> so I suspect with him, he would be busy doing his business. And then when a load of powder and shot and whatever came in, he would be very busy trying to get that 
to Concord. Mm -hmm. And so some of the things that he would follow up in his business, he was letting slide. And then the war came along. So he, the thing was, he died intestate. Had he had a will, you would, we might have known how much it was worth at the time. But to die intestate and have the thing settled later, right. when there was the money was the economy after the revolution was whoa, yeah. awful. Right. So I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and maybe nobody wanted any desks. <laughs> <laughs> if only they would have taken the desks. I have another question. The, I have two questions actually. What's your opinion on the possibility that the closet in the kitchen was actually a staircase okay. leading up to the, what we call the housekeepers run the kitchen chamber? Okay, yeah. <laughs> What's your opinion? Yeah, you think so? Have you? Yeah, I probably, I, 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 you know, Stanley and you and I have done some in the colds of winter. We go through and <laughs> what do you think this was and what do you think that was? We have stuck our heads in that closet up there a number of times, and it's hard to tell. I call that, by the way, on my tours, the stairway from hell. <laughs> because, picture it, there's no railing. When you, from the nursery, you step into a thing, and there is a railing there. But that's it. Now, there's no light. It's inside. The stairs, the risers are like this, the treads are like that, and I'm a servant with a long skirt, and I'm carrying a thing of night soil. Uh, how in the world they ever did it, I do not know. But yes, we stuck our heads in it. They've done a work on that and changed it over the years, the baggy people. And I can understand that, because they might not want the kids running up and down the stairs, for one thing. They might have needed another closet. Mm -hmm. And um, I was reading something in my solitary confinement <laughs> about early houses not, in, not having closets. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah has closets up the yeah. end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, bless his heart. Mm -hmm. Because they were talking about storing these great big pieces of furniture for storing clothes. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you fold up everything and shove it in a drawer. Mm -hmm. But he had closets. Well, he had the chimney space and the open space. Yeah. That's where you put the yeah. closets, right? Yeah. So he yeah. could afford yeah. to put them in. Yeah. yeah, but he was, well, I'm sure other houses would have, could have done yeah, it too. Yeah. But Jerry did it. Jerry did it. And I love, I know I'm not supposed to do it probably, but the closet off his bed chamber. Yeah. If you open the door, there is a line of hooks, wooden hooks. Divine. And also that post that he had capped and beaded. In that closet, the same closet off. Yeah. I mean, in a closet, what do you it? care if the post isn't beautiful? The decorative beading on it. Um, mm -hmm. Never open the door in there. Oh, cool. yeah, open, open the, the door, door and, and look. Yeah, yeah open fine. the door and look. It's, mm -hmm. it's worth it. Mm -hmm. And in the first floor closet off the informal parlor, the paint analysis showed that the shelving on the right is the original shelving. Is it really? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That door I don't touch because it's, it's so, hard. It's, it's like my house. <laughs> I can't open a window and I can't open a door. <laughs> no, everything swelled up so much. But it's a great house. It's deep, yeah. Well, I was going to also say, so the room off, the kind of storage room, the unheated room off the third floor nursery. Yeah. I heard some story, I know it used to be the J.O.J. Frost Gallery, right. but... There's some story about it maybe had been partitioned. I know nobody can tell now because it's chock full of, full of textiles. But what's the story on that room off the nursery? What's the, the point of that? The only thing that I know about it is that the inside wall, that's the wrong way of putting it, um, as you go in, the wall on the left, okay. apparently had cupboards. Oh. Now, I don't know whether it was the bank that did that mm -hmm. or whether it was Jeremiah. But they were long gone when I started working there. And it gave, this was also on Jeremiah, on this stuff, you know. You know all about that. This, what is it? The J.O.J. Frost stuff. Oh. We were, we 
It came to us originally. Okay. His son wanted us to have it. And it, this is where you go with a house committee. And I can understand where they this doesn't fit in an 18th century house. You know, where are we going to put it? So they said, thank you, but no thank you. Some of the stuff was taken, and one of the board members was a man who lived on Front Street. And the stuff was stored in over his garage, not all of them, but there were some paintings put up there. <clears throat> and eventually, we decided, I don't know how we began to get them back, but then there was an auction in New York. We've got the catalog. And in the catalog are listed paintings that were given to us. How did that happen? So they scurried down to this French Street thing and found that some of them that were put there were gone. Some of them that were put there were boiled and were cut. The auction house very nicely came to agreement with us and they would not change what was in the catalog, but the things that were sold, we got them. Is that right? I forgot. We got some of the stuff back and we got money for some of the stuff that was sold. It's unclear to yeah, me. Yeah, okay, it's been a long time. But it was a, an eye-opener because all of a sudden, we just assumed the things were carefully stored somewhere that we didn't take and that we could get our hands on them and then wow! Yeah. Then one of my father's customers bought the house that Frost lived in off Pond Street. And they started working on it and all these paintings came popping out of the walls, <laughs> like the one over there that had the stovepipe through it. He couldn't give them away. He could not give them away. He'd trundle them around town in a wheelbarrow, or as they say in Marblehead, a wheelbarrow. <laughs> and um, they would never, nobody would have, but he and his wife, <coughs> oh, a little off side the story again. This is nothing to do well. Mrs. Frost and he used to grow sweet peas, okay? And there was a thing called the Fruit and Flower Mission in Boston, and it went out of business, I think, in the 1950s. But the Frosts would pick their sweet peas, and they would bring them to a house on the Corner, uh, was, uh, down on Essex Square. It's where the old, near where the old YMCA, where the Chamber of Commerce building is. A little bit. And there's a house on the right with a porch, and Marble Headers would bring food and flowers and stuff and leave them on the porch. The railroad station was across the way. On the first train into town, the conductors would come over and pick all this stuff up and bring it into Boston, and it was given away to the poor. Oh. Nice. Yeah, they got fruit and flowers. Isn't that fun? A lot of them are frost frost. Wow. Yeah. Betty, may I ask you, you started by saying that some of the visitors now don't seem to be as interested in the same things that they have been over time. How do you think historic house museums should stay the same or change or adapt or incorporate what visitors are interested in now? One more time. You, you were just saying that historic house museums have changed over time. Over time? To well, their audience. In, in my time, mm -hmm. I can tell you that very little has changed except colors and interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, we have had some good people help us. Um, Dean Lachakainen, for one, he's helped us over the years with things. Richard Nylander has come and consulted with so not necessarily with me, but with the people called the House Committee, a bunch of ladies that were interesting. Um, and they would ask questions, and they were very good at help. But interpretation has changed a lot in my lifetime. Um, and for the better. Oh, yeah, much, much more so. One of the things I like is being able to go into the rooms now. That makes a big difference. They were standing in that little thing to your head looking at, you couldn't tell. You didn't get a feeling for the room. You couldn't <laughs> see the panel. But it's wonderful because you can point out things 
that would be impossible to see standing in, in those little gates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the audience's desi um, expectations, their interests have changed over time. You said, you know, furniture, and now it's. Yeah. How have you adjusted to that? It's interesting. I don't do furniture. I do point out the, the mirrors, and I point out why they're way up in the sky. They're not to look into, they're to reflect light. Um, you try and do lifestyle a little bit. Um, what the, this is just my way of looking at it. You go into the family parlor. The leaves would have come in that side door, shed whatever clothes they had that they wanted to throw it get it made, come into that room. And I also point out, fires were not in every room. They, if you were in the room, there might have been a fire. But, and also, if you left the room, you shut the damn door, okay? You didn't leave it open. And nowadays, we do that sort of thing. If you've got central heat, what the hell's the difference? If you had a fire, think of the wood they went through. Okay. In that family parlor, they would come in. Remember, this house was primarily used in the wintertime. Why do you say that? I've not well, heard that. Marblehead in the summer was not exactly beautiful. <laughs> a little different. Mm -hmm. The stink would have been unbelievable. <laughs> they had the apparently place. property in Newbury, Newburyport. <clears throat> no, we've never found that property though. No, but that s woman with a second sight that came to the house went off with a guy to Newburyport and they seemed to think they found where it was. The psychic? Yeah. Wow. The psychic. Okay. Okay. I'm like a deed. That table, <laughs> that table that's in the room, I say, remember, this is our house that would have been used primarily in the wintertime. Okay. That table would have moved closer and closer and closer to the fire yes. as the days went on. They'd practically be sitting. I can remember my days at the Gables. I remember reading something about someone sitting in a settle, which was in one of those huge fireplaces. Mm -hmm. And I bumped into this in other places that I read it too. They're sitting there with an ink well, mm -hmm. and they're writing, and it's freezing on the outside of the oh settle, gosh. and they're sitting in the fireplace. Mm -hmm. Talk about cold. Um, and you can point out that for that reason then, bathing was not your number one consideration. Can you imagine what it would have been like to take a bath in that place? To heat the water, get it upstairs to wherever you were. And I love the shower in that sit yeah. bath on the third floor. <laughs> that tickles me no end. It everybody me. loves that. Though. Everybody loves Visitors it. Pick it up and that. show the shower. Yeah. Um, it would have been awful. And that kitchen we had. No, you couldn't do laundry in there. No. Next door you could do the laundry. Or outside. And you have a place to hang it and put it out on the bushes and stuff. Yeah. The other thing that I think is interesting is to realize that in the summertime, they say that the Lee Mansion had no garden. Well, they weren't there in the summer in the first place. They didn't have enough land for a garden in the second place. And I've often wondered where they got their food. If they had a farm thing in Newbury, they put it on a vessel, sail it up here, and it would be preserved, since the ham, something. So they could get their food that way, because there wasn't an awful lot of grocery shopping and you know no Whole Foods down on them. You know, <laughs> there must have been a market in town. Oh, there would have been a market. Markets, and they would have sent yeah. people in. Yeah, yeah. And there was a market in the townhouse. Oh, right, of course. That's yeah. why it's the Market first, Square, right. not right. Townhouse right. Square. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it, it, it would have been just thinking how the Lees lived in it. And also trying to figure out how the hell do the bank people keep their sanity with you? You've got people here and people there and staircases here and staircases there. But you know the one that goes from Mrs. Lee's rooms up to the third was not there originally. Jeremiah would have cut your head off at the shoulders to ruin his upstairs hall. Really? The other thing I want to know is, how long after that wallpaper panel has been hanging 
did they notice that it was upside down? <laughs> I never noticed it. I heard you mention it at the gala, I think, that yeah. night, that it was upside down. I never had noticed it, and I'm like, now I, I, I never it to everybody. <laughs> and Chad Nylander. Yeah. He's the one that mentioned it to me. Really? Yeah. There was a show of wallpaper at the Masonic Museum, wherever it is, Western somewhere. And we had, at that time, several pieces of the original paper that were mounted badly. And, and they were in a closet on the third floor. And they went off to this museum. So Jack and I drove out to see what was going on. And Richard Nylander came over and was talking to me. And he said, that panel wallpaper that's upside down. <laughs> never noticed it. <laughs> but remember, we never went into the rooms. Not that it would help you, <coughs> because it's tucked way off in the so, corner. But the question is, it was put upside down on purpose. That's what I always say. Or did some weirdo put it upside down? <gasps> she said, I hope they don't know. <laughs> 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 but why would they put it on purpose, do you think? <coughs> That's what <Did> Rich <coughs> SOB. <laughs> she can afford to do this, and I gotta go home to. Yeah, right. <laughs> you often wonder who put it up, because it would have taken a certain amount of skill to mix the wallpaper paste. And to put it up without ruining it. Mm. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, there was other wallpaper in the area, North Shore, Boston, so maybe somebody had experience it with could it. Have been. It could have been. The yeah. other thing that's interesting in that room, and now that you can go in, you can point out the graffiti on the wallpaper. Mm. Because there's a man, silhouette of a man, not silhouette, but it's a profile drawing of a man. And then you get the sh ships on the river, and then you get that little boat that's pulled up on the island. All done. Yeah. Where is this? In that same in, the, in that great big bed chamber right, with right, upside down wallpaper. Where, in that same candle. Oh no no, it's yeah. a, it's in different places in the room. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Maybe when there was the Marine Insurance Society. Marine insurance, the Marine Insurance oh, Company. Company. Yeah. Yeah. Room, maybe. The ones that cut the wall through the hole through the wallpaper <laughs> on the paneling. Out. Yeah, they're the one that put the door into the, what is uh, Mrs. Lee's suite, right? Yeah. Also, it's interesting um, is to notice the door from that little room into the bedchamber has got notches in the door frame. Did you notice that? Almost as if there was bars across it at one time. Mm -hmm. I don't know. This is the thing that throws you, because we don't, when I, I wrote a monograph of the historical society, in 1898, 1998. It took me two years. Well, I worked on, in Florida on it. It's funny, too. Jack, my late husband, had a, he had a computer down there. And I would write out sitting in the Florida room in the cold, writing. And I would come in cold. <laughs> <laughs> Remember cold, right? Just let, me, let me just think about that. <laughs> Um, Jack was watching television, and I shut the ro doors to that room, and was sitting in the floor. Room. And he would read it into the computer. There was a program called Naturally Speaking. It was one of the very first ones that came out. And they warned you with the thing, only one person do the dictating on this, because they couldn't re re recognize the voice. Well, we wound up rolling on the floor half the time because some of the stuff that came out was terrible. Still and Jack's voice talking about something. Like, what? It's sort of like the computer doesn't believe in the horn and marble head. They keep giving you that little line. Ah, uh, what did I say? Uh, talk, I think we're going to talk about how we don't know a lot. Yeah. It's mystery. I did not have an awful lot of time to. <laughs> look through a lot of stuff, and there wasn't that much available at that time. We had <coughs> minutes of the board meetings. Now, wouldn't you think that the person who was the recording secretary would have written stuff down? <laughs> but we had a recording secretary. <laughs> One of them was. <laughs> we had a very interesting meeting in that they talked about the proper wallpaper to put on the chamber on the third floor. When the meeting closed, we had delicious libation. To, I don't care about your delicious life. What? My room? What? Pe you know, I 
scream. I was just, it was awful. There was an awful lot of nothing in there. But there was one executive sec a recording secretary who was still alive, and I could call her and ask her, Edith, do you remember? Uh, to, uh, yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. There is, I've, I've been curious, a few people have brought it up. <coughs> we have Jeremiah's supposed bedroom. Martha is across the hall. Yeah. Yet the hallway to the main staircase and the housekeeper's room is right across from Jeremiah's room. Are you insinuating? <laughs> <laughs> but people have asked. Really? Really. They've been watching too many of those. <laughs> this is a modern Son of a I don't, when I've been in that building, man and boy, for how long? <laughs> you know, it never occurred to me. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't think it would have occurred to John Meyer either, unless she was a real looker. Unless you, you know. Right. Yeah. yeah, there's another little thing. I'll leave this out of my of my spiel's when I take people through if there's no time. But the wallpaper that is in the dressing room, in uh, Martha's dressing room, <clears throat> some of it's finished and some of it isn't, yeah. I think. I was always told that wallpaper didn't go up unless it was finished. And we have wallpaper in that room oh, yeah. that's obviously not finished. Yeah. I don't know when that wallpaper Courtesy of Louise Cronenshaw. Mm -hmm. Though that was, a, that was yeah, Louise, Louise Cronenshaw. So that wasn't yeah. obviously not original. Yeah. No, I, I, I point that out, too, because there's parts of it that's penciled in, right, right. and they started to render it. Right. And I'm often thought, why did you put that there? Why didn't you put that someplace where you wouldn't be close up to it? Right. One fun thing in that room is that little table, which is bleached out terribly. A shame, over the years. But I was going through the house a couple of times with uh, Ronald Bergeau, who owns Northeast Auctions. And he would come to do appraisals of the furniture for insurance purposes. And in those days, you didn't have a little thing that you could do in your hands. You had a man with, who wrote it down. Remember writing it down? <laughs> Which was good for me, because I, <clears throat> listen, that's how come I found out it was Mr. Lee's bed checker from Ronald Bourgeois. Yeah, I want to ask you about that when you're done. And so he looked at the table in the, with the Chinese wallpaper that's falling off the walls. And he said, well, there's a hand of an Irishman if I ever saw it. I mean, this is the kind of knowledge that people have. It's unbelievable. So I was bold enough to say, what, how would you know that? He said, well, the man, obviously, he was made here, but he's the man apprenticed in Ireland because there are certain characteristics of the way the legs are formed and the, and the apron that's Irish. Ooh. We were going through the house one day, and just before he came, there was an auction house in New York that had requested a copy of Jeremiah Lee's signature. Did we have one that they could copy? They had an ad they were placing in a magazine to sell a piece of Jeremiah Lee furniture. <laughs> So I was in touch with them, and I said, yes, I'd be happy to do it. But I would like very much to have a tear sheet to see what the piece was. And it was a small, very small bureau, very small, which is unusual, I found out from Ronald Bergeau. So we walked into that room, and he was talking about this, that, and the other thing. And I said to him, Mr. Bergeau, what room in this house do you think was Mr. Lee's bedchamber? Now, I would have thought he would take the one across the hall that was this great big yeah. thing with a gold, with now it's a gold thing. Yeah. And he said, this one, I question. Hmm. And I said, well, where would the bed go? Because we're used to putting the bed head up against the wall. Mm -hmm. He said, right in the middle of the room. I said, ah, that explains it. Mm -hmm. And he said, explain what? And I told him about this piece of furniture. Mm -hmm. We do have the tear sheet in the file. Yeah. And so I came running down, back downstairs, and I got the tail sheet, and I brought it up to him. And he met, looked at the measurements, and he said it would have gone right over there. In other words, we're underneath, beneath King Neptune.
between the uh -huh. two front windows. He said, that's where it would have gone. Well, of course, I like, naively asked if we could possibly find out the name of it. Because the man at the auction house said, the woman has a number of pieces of my, uh, Jeremiah Lee furniture. <laughs> so I said, you <laughs> wouldn't possibly, no way would he give me her name. Uh, I would just like to have photographs yeah. of it. Yeah. We couldn't afford to buy it. Where would, this was here in, in Boston or in? No, it's New York. In New York. New York. Hmm. Yeah. So, that's it, I guess. Do you have something you want to ask me? That was it for me. Thank you. That was fun. So now you've got a little bit more to talk about yeah. when you go in and look for the drawings on the wall. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, do you think it was Louise Crowninshield that set up Jeremiah's bedroom? More like a parlor rather than a bedroom. What can you do? I mean, maybe because we didn't have a bed, so she just because it's more. It. It's like Sheridan furniture too. It's not the right period. No, it's not the right. Period. She might have just. Yeah, that's that's part of the problem. Yeah. To, to, if you're going to do it authentically as his bed chamber, you should have had furniture of that period, mm -hmm. 1760 period, mm -hmm. and we didn't. And don't have all that much furniture in that period. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> even the bed in the yellow chamber is not the right period, but it's covered up. You can't even tell. Oh. We don't actually have a lot of beds, and that's no, it. We, don't. we have. We have a lot of desks. We have so many desks. Buy a desk. So the first floor is mostly the Thank period you know, of the house. The furniture um, is in there. It's up to you. Is that true? Yeah. 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 Yes. I feel like someone you said that. But second floor, yes. third floor, less so, but that yeah. is more or less. Yeah. None of it's original to the house. Yeah. No, it's the chairs. Right? Yeah, but yeah the third floor, I don't yeah. think any of it is colonial. It's all federal or empire, so 18 teens, 1830s, yeah. and the third floor. The second floor. The um the yellow bedroom, the great the guest bedroom. That's pretty good. It's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah. What else is up there? That high chest, by room. the way, you know, that has beautiful. It has two drawers that have a round top to them. It's in, you know, sunken. And the fellow who cleaned it, I said to him, they look so funny. He said, well, they should have gold leaf. Mm -hmm. And I said, really? And he said, yes, and if there had been a drop of it there, he said, I would have replaced the gold leaf on both of the drawers. And you think, oh my God. But remember, the rooms were dark. The candles were not worth anything. And that, that little glimmer of light on the piece of furniture, on the, the brasses and everything, would have been beautiful. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. See you in the morning. <laughs>